Good day, everyone. Uh, I am Michael Cornett. I want to welcome you to the Forest Mazars International Tax Update. Uh, and we thank you for taking the time today to join us. Uh, today, we're going to touch on three topics. Today, we're going to talk about non residents and investment in U.S. property. We're going to talk about Pillar 2 and considerations in mergers and acquisitions. And then we're going to talk about the DCL proposed regulations. Uh, again, I am Michael Cornett. I am a managing director in Forbes Mazar's Washington National Tax Office. Uh, I uh, specialize in international tax matters. Uh, and I'll let the, my uh, co presenters introduce themselves as well. Jason. Thanks, Mike. Yep, I'm Jason Sullivan. I'm an international tax partner for Ms. Mazars. I sit in Charlotte, North Carolina. Been with the firm for almost 11 years. Hi, my name's uh, Justin Metcalf. I'm a uh, director with the International Tax Group in Charlotte as well. Um, been with the firm, oof, probably um, almost 10 years, almost, maybe almost nine years as well, or eight or nine, something like that. Um, um, and, uh, you know, primarily specialize these days in a lot of uh, Pillar 2. And last but not least, Ann. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Ann Bontrons, a member of Forvis Mazar's international tax team, and I sit in Charlotte, North Carolina as well. My area of focus include income tax, compliance, and consulting for middle market business and individual with cross-border transactions and activities. And with that, we'll get started with Ann taking us on to non-residents and U.S. real property. Awesome. So as the U.S. continue to be the hot market for foreign investor, one of the topics we discussed today would be income tax compliant for non-residents owning U.S. real property. And on the agenda today, we'll talk about some structuring of owning U.S. real property, how the income such as rental and gain will be taxed, walk through some definitions and withholding requirement. And throughout the presentation, we'll provide some high-level compliance procedure as, as IRS has increasingly been uh, ramped up with its compliance in effort in numerous campaign over the last few years on compliance of these U.S. Uh, real property interests. All right, so um, investment in U.S. real property. So a lot of time we've seen that individual and company invest through various structures. So there's really no one size fit all is the best approach. One can own the property outright or through a holding entity, whether it US or foreign structure, which is a corporation's partnership or through a transparent single member LLC. I have seen a lot of more uh, on the individual side, so single member LLC and C Corp structure. Michael, could you help comment on some of the debt investment when it comes to owning a U.S. real property? Yeah, thanks, Ann. Yeah, I mean, some investors, you know, really don't want to have an ownership in the real estate, so they will invest in the U.S. real estate market through debt, you know, either through some type of, you know, funding vehicle or a direct lend to that. You know, for them, the advantages of that really are, you know, that they can maybe uh, get a reduced rate of withholding. They don't have to report as much to the U.S. tax uh, system. So you'll see different financing vehicles that bring in um, foreign investors into the U.S. real estate market. And I'm going to go back to this slide, but on this next slide where we talk about how income is taxed, so before we jump into the rental income and interest income taxations, I want to give a high level U.S. taxations on U.S. non-U.S. persons. So non-U.S. persons are subject to tax on U.S. source income only. And U.S. source income include but not limited to fixed determinable annual or periodic income, which is FDAP. And for that payment to non-U.S. persons are subject to a 30% withholding rate or a lower treaty rate where applicable. Common example of these payments include dividend paid by a U.S. corporation, interest, royalty, rental. And then another type of U.S. source income is the income that is effectively connected to a U.S. trade or business. And the difference is that ECI is subject on a net 
basis at graduated ordinary rate, which means is 30% for up to 30% for individual or 21% flat rate for corporations. And so when it comes coming back to direct investment, so when an individual invests in a US under their direct name or single member LLC, the rental income is treated as VDAP income, which is subject to the 30% withholding rate, generally on gross rent. And where certain conditions are met, these individuals can make election under Section 871D, which would allow them to treat the rental income as ECI and therefore able to claim deduction, including depreciations, mortgage interest, real estate tax, et cetera. And then the tax rate would apply on ordinary rate for individual 37% and 21% for corporations. Corporation can make the elections under Section 882D to get the net basis approach. One item to consider for owning a property through a non-US corporation is the idea of additional branch profit tax. It is dividend equivalent, which is taxed at 30% or lower treaty rate and is determined by assessing the change in US equity during the year. But one benefit of that is that when the income rental income is repatriated, there's no second layer of U.S. taxation. And then another alternative structure would be non-U.S. Um, investor, you know, form a U.S. C-Corp to own the property. The U.S. C-Corp then would get taxed at 21% on the net income. So there's no special election to be made. If the earnings are repatriated from the U.S. corporation to the foreign persons, then there will be a 30% withholding on that dividend income or a lower treaty rate, depending on the country in which treaty applied. A lot of time, the dividend is a distribution of current, higher of current ENP, earning and profit or accumulated earning and profit. So to the extent that the amount distribution is in excess of ENP, it will be considered a return of capital and therefore not subject to US tax. And then subsequently, it will be a capital gain portion. Another alternative would be that owning the US real estate through a non-US corporation, and then that non-US corporation then hold US um, corporations. A couple of reasons why this might be optimal is um, the U of non-US corporations, which is a non-US cited asset, which may limit the exposure of US estate tax. And we can go more in detail on the estate considerations on another webinar. And another second um, consideration would be structure would be when it exit the US tax there would be um, a way of selling the non-US corporation stock without US tax considerations, which lead us into the next slide, talking about disposition of US real property interest. So generally, capital gain is not a tax to the country of residence. So capital gain in the US, like selling of stock, would not be taxable to a non-resident. However, Section 8, 97 determined that U.S. real property interest sale would be considered taxable as ECI and subject to U.S. tax. And dispositions also not just include sales, but exchange, gift, redemptions, et cetera. And then part of this slide, we would also go through the FUCTA provisions. FUCTA stands for Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act. And this provision requires the purchaser to withhold tax at a 15% gross proceed unless an exemption apply. And we can walk through some of the exemptions later. And then on the next few slides, Michael will walk us through some of the definition for U.S. real property interest holding. Thanks, Anne. So, you know, there's really two, you know, key definitions under Section 897. 
One is, you know, United States real property interest or U.S. RPI. <clears throat> I mean, in its normal sense, it's, you know, it's easy to say when I have land, when I have a building, but it is broader than that. It does include personal property uh, that's associated with the use of the real property or, in, in the, tr and, um, or the trade or business, for example, a hotel. A lot of the personal property in a hotel would be considered U.S. real property interest uh, because the hotel obviously can't operate without it. Uh, it can also include an interest or stock interest in a domestic corporation, uh, provided the domestic corporation is a U.S. real property holding company. Uh, it generally does not include stock uh, in a foreign corporation unless that foreign corporation happens to make an 897i election. Uh, and then we'll talk a little more about interest in the partnership. So as you can see, the U.S. RPI definition is rather broad. Um, and then the other definition is U.S. real property holding company. Uh, as we talked about, an interest in a U.S. U.S. real property holding company can also be treated as U.S. RPI. Uh, U.S. real property holding company is a domestic corp. And if it meets the test of the fair market value of the, of the U.S. RPIs held by that company, uh, Equor exceeds 50% of its interest, <clears throat> all its interest in real property and other assets used for uh, or held for use in an active trader business. So, testing for U.S. real property holding company status, uh, there's a lot of different testing dates. Um, definitely do it at the end of every year, but it can happen throughout the year. So, there's a lot of in the regulations, there's a lot that talks about when this tests are made. One thing to be aware of, what we call the startup trap here is, you know, you may have formed a U.S. company, it's acquired the land, uh, it starts to build, let's say, a new plant or something of that nature. Uh, before the plant becomes operational, let's say you decide to sell that domestic corporation because in its early years, it was a U.S. real property holding company because it didn't have assets used in a trade or business. That sale could be subject to 897. So it's really important to understand when you turn on that U.S. trader business, when something goes into that, because just buying assets to use in the future doesn't count. They actually have to be used in that trader business. So be very careful when you've started a corporation, uh, because kind of once you have U.S. real property holding company status, it kind of remains with the company. Uh, you can cleanse it uh, if you get rid of all your U.S. real property interest held by that U.S. real property holding company. But so it's really important to do that. Um, when you do have assets, if it owns stock and other companies are look through provisions that also apply to determine whether or not you pick up the assets of those weird lower tier companies. Now let's briefly touch on partnerships. You know, under 897 itself, partnerships are not explicitly treated as US RPIs. Um, but, you know, if you do exchange a partnership interest, uh, money or property receive in exchange for that interest, you'll look through to see if any gain has been uh, associated with U.S. RPIs. And so if it is, it'll be caught by 897. Um, one thing where a partnership can be treated as U.S. RPI, but it's for withholding tax purposes under 1445, is what they call a 50-90 partnership. So 50% of the gross value of the partnership assets are U.S. RPIs, and 90% then of the partnership's assets are uh, U.S. RPIs plus cash or cash equivalents, then that disposition will automatically be subject to withholding, which we'll talk a little bit further on here as we go forward. But so be careful with partnerships because the interest in the partnership itself may not be, but obviously the underlying assets may be U.S. RPIs, and you know that's consistent with the look through principles associated with partnerships. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Anne. Yeah, on this next slide, we'll talk about withholding tax on disposition. So as previously mentioned, but the um, section um, 1445 impose a 15% withholding tax on amount realized. And the way we determine amount realized would be cash proceed, any fair market value of property transfer or exchange, and any liability that the transferee assume. And to avoid that withholding, there would be some uh, various exemption from withholding. And a lot of time, what I've seen is that the principal resident exemptions, where the proceed is less than 300000 and the person would, in, like the buyer, would use that as their primary residence. So there's a process to go through and get that exemption. 
And then another time, a lot of time we've seen non-recognition provisions where the notice would be supplied to the IRS within 20 days of transaction. So a lot of these certificates for exemptions require advanced planning in terms of timing because it could take up to 90 days processing time by the IRS. And then the individual and the corporate foreign corporation would need to apply for TIN number as well. So um, some of the form that would be required for withholding agent would be uh, form 8288 and 8288 8. And then the agent would have about 20 days to submit these form after the transactions and remit the tax withholding to the IRS. And one thing to mention is that the withholding agent would be the buyer, the real estate agents or attorney, closing attorney. So if there's no proper withholding, those people, the buyer agents would be held liable for the tax. And then on the next slide, we'll talk about, this is just a summary of pretty much everything we talk about for various holding structure and rental income withholding on 30% gross unless election is made or um, the dispositions of 15% withholding. And one thing to note here on this slide, there's an error on column of domestic partnership owned by US a non-US resident individual. The disposition withholding amount is still 15% on gross um, proceed. We'll, we'll send out a deck after the um, webinar and you would receive the corrected version. I won't talk um, or go through each of these box, but I want to highlight some of the other considerations when it comes to owning U.S. property is that um, estate tax consideration. So non-residents are exposed to U.S. Um, cited asset and the exemption amount is only 60000 per lifetime of that individual. So careful considerations and um, treaty applications for either a higher exemption amount or additional deduction should be considered where we have treaty with that certain country. And then another thing would be state income tax considerations where withholding on rental as well as sale should be evaluated based on the state tax law. And then um, additional form consider would be 1042, 1042S on various withholding of rental income. And then for partnership itself, um, it would be 8804, uh, 8805 form. Um, let's see, anything else you can think of, Michael, before we move on to the next slide? No, no I think we can go on to our, our polling question. Um, so we'll get that up here. So uh, polling question is section 897 applies to the sale of US real property by a US citizen. True or false? We'll give you a, a little bit of time here to answer that. All right, uh, looks like the results are in. 57.2 uh, said that is uh, true. 42.8 said it's false. Uh, the correct answer is false because it's a U.S. citizen. 897 applies to non-residents and foreign persons. Selling property is not applied to a U.S. citizen. And with that, we'll turn it over to uh, <clears throat> Justin to start our Pillar 2 discussion on uh, considerations of mergers and acquisitions. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so... Um, and before we dive into 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 the nuance of you know you know pillar two and how it applies in the M and A what we're seeing in the M and A space and what we could for, we could we could see going into this new year coming up, um, I think it's important to kind of understand conceptually um, you know how pillar two works. What is how how does mecha the mechanisms to to which it you know um, where it's affected and where M and A space could actually you know affect the calculation itself. Um, Sorry, one second. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, what is what is Pillar 2, right? So Pillar 2, you know, started, you know, as for the many people that have probably heard this 5 million times now, 
Um, you know, it started in December of in October of 21. It was agreed to at the G20. We had model rules issued in December, which basically laid the framework of a unified approach um, for a for one global minimum tax. And um, what what it was designed to do is to create a mechanism where jurisdictions globally were taxing, you know, their 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 groups, their m and groups and constituent entities at, a, at an effective tax rate of 15%. You know, for those that have been tuning into the campaign tr chatter for, for the uh, future of uh, where, where the U.S. is headed, you know, there's been talks about a 15% stat rate uh, in the campaign trail. Um, this, you know, obviously puts a, puts a little bit of a, a, a hurdle on, on how this applies to Pillar 2. So it's one thing to be mindful of. But Generally, you're you're within scope of pillar two if you meet a certain threshold, and what that means is you have to first characterize who is your multinational enterprise group. You know that means figuring out who the ultimate parent entity is and who the constituent entities below are. Um, once you have figured who that M &E, what that M &E group looks like, you know structurally, then you have to look to the global revenues um, in, over a four-year period, and if you can say attributing all the revenue by every entity in that group, including excluded entities, right? That revenues uh, it, uh, amounted two out of the last four fiscal years of Euro 750 million or more. You are what we call in the soup for pillar two, and you have to start considering what that means um, starting in 2024 and on. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier, right? You know, it is designed to achieve that, that the, we have this jurisdictional minimum tax affect the tax rate of 15%. Um, the way the rules are structured today, right? Um, you know, th there's this big, there's this big question mark right now about, you know, what if, you know, the, you know, the, here we're, we're predominantly concerned about the U.S. So, you know, the U.S., it's, it's no secret that the U.S. Um, is not, not anywhere near uh, adopting pillar two into its local legislation. Um, so, you know, today, you know, but but the way the the pillar two rules work is it doesn't really matter, and I'll explain why in a second here. Um, the way I think of pillar two is it, every jurisdiction in the world has to figure out what their top up tax is, right? And we have these kind of charging mechanisms that have been laid out in the OECD model rules, um, specifically in Article two of the OECD model rules and. Um, through, through another means in Article Five of this QDMTT. So, what are these these three top up, uh, these these three charging mechanisms? So, Pillar Two thinks about a jurisdictional tax. You know, think about that. There's one top up tax. Country must abide by it. You know, whether you like it or not. And the way the OECD's interlocking charging rules um, work, it's designed to ensure that it doesn't matter if a jurisdiction doesn't adopt as long as one jurisdiction in the group has adopted all three. So with that said, you know, there's this thing called an income include, well, let's start with the QDMTT. That's the easy, you know, the qualified domestic minimum top of tax, um, which really comes first. And it's been, and multiple jurisdictions have enacted a QDMTTs today. And that will play into a bigger role when we talk about the DCL interaction rules um, later. But in, in, in plain English, what a QDMTT is, is it's a local country minimum tax that follows the design and stresses the outcomes of the Pillar 2 rules laid out by the OECD. So it gives the local jurisdiction the first crack at the apple of making sure that it's topped up at 15% effectively, not statutorily. Um, the next piece is you think about this thing called the income inclusion rule, which again has been enacted. Um, you know, there's an EU directive out there and multiple jurisdictions have also enacted into their own jurisdictional laws today um, of this income inclusion rule. And, and the way the income inclusion rule works is it says, looking at my m and &E group, right, that I've taken on the front end, I've had to characterize on the front end, starting at the very top, right, the ultimate parent entity. Um, I asked myself, does the top entity have a what we call an income inclusion rule, right? A qualified IIR, um, and if it doesn't, then you you go down a tier until you find a jurisdiction that has enacted a qualifying IIR. And what the qualifying IIR does is it basically leaves, basically gives the top co entity the ability 
to collect tax on behalf of any low tax constituent entities under under its chain of ownership. So, you know, a, a key a key prevalent rule in pillar two and understanding it is knowing your structure and knowing who owns who and what the what the the ownership percentages are. Um, so that's how the IIR works. So QDMTT comes first, the IIR comes next. And then you have this thing called the under tax payments rule, which as of today, South, um, you know, South Korea was the first to actually push it through and it's set to be fully enacted by 2025. And what the under tax payment rule does, <coughs> sorry, what the under tax payment rule does is it basically says, if you've not been top looking to your entire m and &E group structure, if you have not been topped up in a particular jurisdiction through the IIR or the QDMTT, then that that jurisdiction's top-up tax will be collected based off an allocation mechanism that gives UTPR enacting jurisdictions the ability to collect tax. So I'll, I'll give an example of how all this kind of comes into fruition through through a practical example. So let's come back to that. But there the, the, the key takeaway in understanding Pillar 2 is that it is a, its own set of tax rules and it's contemplating kind of a unified approach to this one 15% one, one, uh, ETR uh, by jurisdiction. So without further ado, let's, let's use a practical example. So um, in front of me here, you know, we have a, a structure. We have a U.S. parent entity who's the UPE, we'll say, and under this U.S. parent entity, which is a corporation, right, it owns a U.S. LLC, which is a disregarded entity flow through, um, a single member LLC that in turn owns a Canadian corporation. Um, brother, sister to that, you have a Dutch co BV in, in the Netherlands, right, that is owned 100% by the U.S. UPE. And under Dutch co BV, you have the U.K. and you have the Bahamas, right, brother, sister all wholly owned. So today let's let's assume for purposes of this example the US and the Bahamas have not enacted a QDMTT because KMT does not meet the definition of a QDMTT and the the US guilty regime does not meet the it does it does not have an IIR it, there is no IIR in any of these jurisdictions because you know guilty in the US is not a qualifying IIR and um, Bahamas doesn't have anything like that and no utpr in the system either for the us or the bahamas and let's say dutch the netherlands uk and canada which actually are have all pledged to enact all three at some point in time some have already, i think all of them have already enacted an iir or qdmtt of some sorts right the uk was the first to enact the first qdmtt i believe um have all enacted all three so if we agree in this illustration here that Everybody here, every jurisdiction in this structure will be subject to the top-up tax, regardless of whether Pillar 2 has been enacted or implemented in the jurisdiction. This is how the rules will work. So we know that Dutch Co. BV, Netherlands, UK, and Canada have enacted QDMTTs in my example. So Dutch Co. BV will collect its share of top-up tax under the Pillar 2 rules through its QDMTT as will UK and Canada do with their respective income in their jurisdiction. By doing that, you know, UK um, and Canada, right, and Dutch Co. BV will have, at this point, been compliant with Pillar 2. They will not owe a top-up tax, right, because they've already got their first crack at the apple. Um, we have a problem, though. We know that the U.S., you know, has no, top, has no QDMTT, and we know the Bahamas does not. So, Here's where now the IIR and the, and the UTPR will have to come in into play. So if you follow what I said earlier, the IIR you know, starts at the top of the house. So we'll go to UPE and ask ourselves, does the U.S. have a qualifying IIR today? The answer to that is no. Um, and, you know, it's, it's it was a subject of debate for many months, but the plain, simple answer of that is no. So we go down a tier and we ask ourselves, OK, is there any jurisdiction here that does have an IR? Well, we know Canada has an IIR, but it doesn't own anything under it, so we don't need to worry about that. But then we see Dutch Co. BV here, right? They have an IIR, and they own the UK and Bahamas. UK has been topped up by its QDMTT, but the Bahamas is still delinquent in its top-up tax obligations. So 
by application of the IIR, the Netherlands will have the ability to collect the tax on behalf of the Bahamas um, that, according to the Pillar 2 rules, the Bahamas should be rightfully taxing through a QDMTT. So Dutch CoBV will collect Bahamas' as top-up tax and thus make you know, Bahamas compliant for Pillar 2 purposes. But even then, we still have a problem, right? Because the U.S. On, at the top of the house has not been topped up. And if it is below the 15% ETR, which if we do get that 15% stat rate um, that's been talked about on the campaign trail, that could pose a problem um, specifically with the UTPR absent any safe harbors that um, those who have been following the rules are aware of. So what the UTPR would do is say, okay, whatever the U.S.'s top-up tax should be, it'll be allocated based off employee headcount and tangible assets at UTPR jurisdictions, which in our case is Canada, Dutch Co. BV, and the UK. So what this means is that the U.S.'s top-up tax will be collected based on, um, on an allocation mechanism that looks to all three of these jurisdictions, employee headcount and jurisdictional asset, uh, fixed asset count. Um, OECD, uh, you know, with very much of the OECD is looking at here is who ha who likely has a substance in the M&E group to collect that tax. And that's how they've decided to, you know, allocate this UTPR to top up the U.S. So <coughs> without, you know, that's kind of a plain, quick, watered down application of of, of the of how Pillar 2 works. Now, in, in phrasing the top up tax, right, you know, it, cons it considers net globe income, right? Net globe income, globe income. Some call, people call it globe income. Others call it globe. Um, still, tomato, tomato, the same thing. Article three talks, you know, has the has it gives you gives you a a you know a, a guide on how to phrase what is income that's subject to pillar two, and in phrasing that that income that is subject to pillar two. Very much how we think of the U.S. tax, you know, going from book to tax through Schedule M adjustments, you know, you know, taxable income principles. Pillar two has the same thought process, and what we're what we've been seeing, you know, as of today, and and as we head into into this new world of Pillar two, is that there's quite a bit of um, there's quite there's quite a bit of an issue when you think about purchase accounting, um, in the context of um, you know, of Pillar two, because you know. When, when we're, you know, P Pillar 2's income base is largely derivative off financial accounting net income or loss, right? And, you know, financial accounting generally allows for fair market value upon acquisition to be pushed down. This is the, the, the whole concept of, you know, um, controlled entity purchases an entity that's, you know, and and um, allocates its, its uh, fair market value among the group. And then, you know, U.S. GAAP gives you the ability to push down that value to the you know to to the entities right so that's so we, what we've seen in, in the in the most recent recently is that this this seems to be one of the most uncertain pieces for MA activity going on pillar two because article 6.2.1 c the of the globe rules generally um requires that you ignore purchase accounting adjustments right except in certain situations right and, and what they, they say is that you use historical carrying values. This becomes a problem, right? Because, you know, when you think, uh, you know, step, having a stepped up basis when you're, you know, when you're, you know, when you're buying something from a U.S. tax perspective, you know, having a stepped up basis in assets is generally seen as a beneficial attribute. And, you know, Article 6 says, you know, ha and, you know, part of that stepped up basis is the push down. Right, that the push down accounting adjustments that you would you would recognize when you do buy an asset, right? Article six poses a problem because there is no purchase price accounting, right? And thus you don't get the heightened depreciation and amortization deductions that you normal normally would see on your on if this was like a U.S. kind of acquisition, um, and that you know that that could lead to some pretty staggering results. You know where you think you're saving money in on the U.S. end, but when pillar, if you're in, in scope in pillar two, and 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 you know you, you have an acquisition within this period, you have to now think about you know could I just be am I just trading you know one attribute for another under pillar two, and and at the end of the day I'm recognizing a cash tax liability 
um, through, through a pillar two top up tax piece. So that's one thing one thing to consider. Now, you know, um, you know, when we say historical carrying value, we're really talking about pre acquisition value. And Article Six of the Globe Rules really talks about you know understanding what that historical carrying value. When you go into the Globe commentaries, there's a lot of commentary about you know you know if understanding when you know push down this 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 poses a problem because a lot of companies that have been sold right could have had purchase price accounting adjustments baked into their financials and then resold again and what article six is really getting at specifically 6.2.1 c of the globe rules what they're really getting at is saying we want you to strip out this purchase purchase price accounting adjustments right because the, the OECD sees this as a way to, to cause material distortions in effective tax rates globally. So, you know, um, the question becomes, you know, there's this, this outright question out there about, do these rules apply to transactions that occurred prior to Pillar 2? Well, this is a relatively um, controversial one. It's, it, you know, the OECD secretariat, I believe, at, at, a, at one of these conferences globally has actually commented on this saying that um, they believe it should apply at, for everything after Pillar 2. But there is a there is kind of a contradiction to that, because if you think about where the commentaries are about stripping out purchase price accounting in Article 6 of the Globe commentaries, right? Um, and and when you think about, you know, how, you know, Article 9, so Article 9 of the, of the Globe rules talks about tracking, you know, new tax attributes relative to the Globe rules, from the, the first globe year and on, you know, the commentary has been that, you know, requiring going back and stripping out purchase accounting, um, you know, would, would, would convolute the process and make, make things onerous for, for most taxpayers. But, um, you know, it does, you know, it does pose a problem because this commentary about getting down to historical carrying value, um, is directly in Article 6, and it's pretty deliberate that the OECD and their rules were thinking of stripping out and, you know, what, what they perceive as a material distortion. So in, in the interest of time, we're going to um, get this so, so everyone gets their CPE on the, uh, on the uh, um, uh, polling question. But, you know, what, what I would what, – what we'd say today, right, is, you know, there, this – Tax due diligence is 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 the key for when we enter into the 2024 2025 you know um, 2024 compliance and 2025 um, uh, deal planning, and what 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 companies are recommended to do today is you want to evaluate your positions with transfer pricing, you want to assess where you have uh, potential top up taxes, and and you want to also understand your 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 M and A activity and deals that are on uh, in play. And when you're when you're thinking about your top up taxes, you want to be thinking about, you know, what not just from a U.S. tax standpoint, but you also want to be thinking about a pillar two standpoint, because what we're seeing today is that the two ha the, the two are interchangeable and what what affects one could affect the other. Um, you know, um, there's uncertainty on on how tax credits and tax incentives work um, go forward. And um, you do have to think about, you know, your DTLs, right, from a U.S. gap perspective as well as a pillar two perspective. So this is very much a a new a new uh, a new regime where you want to um, where, where you want to think about, you know, not just U.S. centric, but also pillar two centric and what that means to your tax accounting for both um, and, and the various elections on that. So in the, in, in the interest of time, we'll keep going here. Um, so things to think about, you know, you know, whether you do an asset uh, uh, purchase or a stock purchase, um, consider this this piece on historical carrying value that I discussed about the, the lack of the ability to, to use per, um, push down accounting and and purchase price adjustments to, you know, get get you a more favorable answer from a tax perspective does it does create kind of, um, you know, staggering results when you're when you're thinking about it from 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 both lenses, um, you know, IP transfers, right? You want to think about that. Um, you know, you want to think about financing structure. So there is one rule in, in the pillar two rules that is, you know, there there's the, these things that called hybrid arbitrage rules that's being applied today, the transitional CBCR safe harbors. And um, for and also um, you have intra group financing arrangements. So, 
you know, when you're thinking about post deal planning entering into the new year, you want to think about whether, you know, if you're loaning money between two related entities, um, you know, you want to think about who's a low tax and a high tax entity because you could have adjustments under the pillar two rules that change your results from a pillar two math standpoint where doing this arrangement could have saved you money on the U.S. side. But the backdrop is it could just be topped up through a UTPR or a QDMTT on another side. So um, with that said, you know, um, we can be here talking about pillar two for for hours but i think the key thing here is when you're going into the new year from a from an overall you know um pillar two standpoint and well from an overall deal standpoint you want to think about pillar two and you want to think about the u.s tax considerations for that because um there what on one hand you you could think you're saving money um by doing something on a u.s side but when you do run the math and you are in scope for pillar two, you could actually be creating yourself kind of a distortion that hurts you um, from an overall global ETR perspective. So without fur further ado, let's get to the next polling question here. So has the United States incorporated pillar two in the US tax code? True or false? I think it, I, I think I might've answered this one, but I will let others uh, get to this one here. And for the and for those that are you know while you're answering this for those that are interested in the pillar two uh series here you know we are you know forbes mazars is um um we have we do have a 10-part web series that covers um pillar the oecd model rules um and um considerations that companies should be thinking about that's really really meant meant to to draw to the nuances on how pillar two works so that that others would uh you know, others can can understand, you know, how Pillar Two works when when doing you know post you know post uh, um, 2024 planning. So here we go. We have our first uh, we have our first uh, answers here. So um, majority the majority is right. The U.S. has not incorporated Pillar Two in the U.S. tax code, and the reason for that is um, Cam T today and to incorporate Pillar Two into the U.S. tax code. You have to ad either adopt a UTPR, an IIR, or a QDMTT. The closest thing to a QDMTT is is the CAMT regime, and we know that the problem with CAMT and why it does not amount to a QDMTT is because CAMT um, looks to adjusted financial statement income, uh, which is net income, uh, which is net income, uh, you know, of one billion. Uh, really net income of 1 billion and pillar two looks to 750 million euro in revenue. So CAMT likely does not meet the, the definition of a QDMTT. And then the other one would be, it, do we have an IIR? And the closest thing to an IIR is, is the guilty regime, right? Which the problem with the, our current guilty regime under section 951 cap a of the code today is that it, that it allows the ability, for example, for the U for 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 the U.S. to use Spanish losses um, against German income, right, to arrive to a tax, and that's a big no-no because that's it allows for jurisdiction jur cross jurisdictional blending, and that and Pillar Two contemplates a country by country type regime. So, without further ado, let me kick it over to Jason here um, to talk through for our DCL proposed regs. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the dual consolidated loss proposed regulations. And DCL stands for dual consolidated losses. And these rules have been in the code and in the regulations for quite some time. But in August of this year, Treasury issued proposed regulations that clarified some, some questions related to the DCL rules and how they interact with the consolidated return rules as well as application of the DCLs to all the Pillar 2 rules and a few other rules as well. But in the interest of time, let's go ahead and move to a polling question. And I'm going to, I know it's hard to answer the question now, but um, I promise you I will give you the answer in just a few slides. So the question is, is the dual consolidated loss regulations applied to a foreign branch operated by an individual, true or false? 
Okay. So 48% said true, 51% false. It is false. You have to have a domestic C corporation that has a separate unit, has a DCL. Okay. So without further ado, let's rush on. I got about 10 minutes to run through these things. Um, so I might be skipping over a few slides just in, in the interest of time. Our agenda, I'm going to go over high level what the DCL rules state currently, and I'm going to go over high level how you calculate a DCL. And then we're going to go into the proposed regulations, including uh, some of those clarifications I talked about, including interaction with Pillar 2, and these things called the disregarded payment loss rules. Okay? So big picture, what do the DCL's rules try to accomplish? What they try to do is they try to... Um, prevent the double dipping of tax losses between the U.S. and a foreign jurisdiction, okay? And here's the answer to your polling question, second bullet point there. You have to have a domestic C corporation that has a loss attributable to one of three things, either a foreign disregarded entity, a foreign branch, or a foreign hybrid partnership, okay? And as you can see, these entities, these are called collectively separate units. If these entities have a loss, those losses have to be able to flow up to the U.S. domestic corporation in order for you to be subject to the DCL rules, okay? So if these entities have a loss, they could be potentially used to double dip against uh, income of another foreign uh, corporation for foreign law purposes, but they could flow into the domestic C corporation's return, thus having your double dip. Okay, so if you've got a foreign use, quote unquote, foreign use of these DCLs, you cannot take that loss into the U.S. Okay, if you don't have a foreign use, the U.S. corporation has to make a domestic use election in order to be able to take that loss in the U.S. So let's go through a quick example. We've got U.S. corporation here, domestic C corporation. It owns foreign corporation one that's treated as a disregarded entity for U.S. tax purposes. Okay. Foreign Corporation owns Foreign Corporation 2. Foreign Corporation 2 is treated as a foreign corporation for U.S. tax purposes. It's a CFC, okay? Let's assume that the foreign jurisdiction here has an income tax, and it also has a consolidated income tax regime, okay? Let's assume further that Foreign Corporation 1 has a DCL, and we'll tell you how to calculate that here in just a little bit, of $100, okay? Let's assume that Foreign Corporation 2 has gross income of 200 now, for Corporation 1 and for Corporation 2 file in a consolidated foreign tax regime, and that DCL, that $100 of DCL, offsets $200 of gross income of foreign Corporation 2 in that consolidated foreign return, okay? But that $100 DCL also is able, absent these rules, to flow up to the U.S. corporation, and the U.S. corporation can take a deduction. So there's your double dip, right? That DCL of Foreign Corporation 1 is able to offset income of the U.S. corporation, and that same loss, that $100 loss, is able to offset income of a foreign corporation under the consolidated uh, return in the foreign jurisdiction. It's important to know that in order to have foreign use of a DCL that would prevent the DCL from coming into the U.S., is that um, it has to offset under foreign law income of an entity that's considered a foreign corporation for U.S. tax purposes, okay? So if foreign corporation two here was a disregarded entity, you would not have a foreign use of that DCL, okay? So calculation of a DCL, I'm just going to run through this rule real quick. You usually use U.S. tax principles, you start with book income, you make all your normal taxable income adjustments to come down to a loss or an income. If it's a loss, it's a DCL. If it's income, it's not subject to these rules, okay? However, if you've got um, transactions between the separate unit, that's, for example, that foreign disregarded entity, and the U.S. parent, those transactions are disregarded in calculating the DCL, okay? So you, could have, you have to remove some income and some deductions that would otherwise be disregarded in calculating your DCL. So in other words, back to our example, if Foreign Corporation One here provided services to the US corporation and received $500 for such services, that those transactions are disregarded from US tax purposes and you would have to eliminate the $500 income of Foreign Corporation One in calculating Foreign Corporation One's DCL or income. 
So let's go go on to the proposed regulations. Big picture, um, the proposed regulations on the DCL rules, they clarify some interactions between the DCL rules and the and, uh, consolidated return rules, okay? Big picture, and I'm, I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly. If you've got a separate unit that has sold property to another member of the consolidated group and it's at a loss, that loss is generally deferred under the consolidated return regulations until that property or the members lead the consolidated group. The clarification here in the proposed reg says that that loss, even though it's deferred, once it gets triggered, is still a DCL and you still have to run through those same rules, okay? Another um, thing that they clarified was under the rules now that sits, if foreign corporation two were to have subpart F income, that subpart F income will be considered gross income of foreign corporation one here, the DRE, in calculating foreign corporation one's DCL, okay? So you can easily manipulate the income of a separate unit and increasing it uh, by increasing the gross income and therefore hopefully eliminating a DCL if you put other CFCs underneath the DRE to inflate the, the gross income there. The proposed reg says that's not going to happen anymore. You cannot increase um, a, uh, the income of a separate unit by deemed income like subpart F income or dividend. Let's move on to pillar two and how the DCO rules uh, interact with, with uh, the, the, the pillar two rules. Big picture, we've got the QDMTT and the IIR. Now, those, um, those are not really considered income taxes, but for purposes of the DCO rules under the pros regulations, they are considered an income tax, okay? So in other words, if you've got a loss that's computed under a jurisdictional QDMTT or an IIR, it's still considered, it could be foreign use under the DCL rules. I think the easiest way to do this is let's go through some, some quick examples. So back to our example, okay? Let's say for example, foreign corporation one here does not have an income tax regime, okay? But it still has a hundred dollar loss, okay? And for corporation two here in the same jurisdiction, doesn't have an income tax, but it has $200 of gross income. But the foreign jurisdiction has enacted a QDMTT, okay? And, and like Justin was saying, QDMTT is calculated on a jurisdictional basis, right? So in other words, if we're trying to figure up that foreign jurisdiction's QDMTT related to foreign corporation one and two, you're going to combine that $100 loss, okay, which would otherwise be a DCL that could flow into the U.S. corporate return against the $200 of gross income of foreign corporation two. That netting, that jurisdictional netting is considered foreign use under the proposed DCL rules. And that means that $100 loss cannot go into the U.S. corporation's taxable income. Okay. So let's look at an IIR example as well. A little bit of a different fact pattern here. We've got U.S. corporation that owns foreign corporation. Um, it is a foreign disregarded entity organized in country X. And country X has an IIR, okay? Foreign Corp owns foreign Corp 1, which is a country Y DRE, okay? And country Y doesn't have an income tax, nor does it have a QDMTT. But foreign Corp 1 has a loss, okay? And let's say Foreign Corp 2 is also a country Y corporation, but it's a corporation from a U.S. perspective, okay? Not a DRE. And let's say it has $200 of gross income. Under the IIR, okay, of country X, since country Y does not have a QDMTT or an income tax, you're going to have to come to um, the jurisdictional book income, if you will, of country Y to say how much uh, top-up tax is going to happen at foreign corp, okay? So in, in order to do that, you've got to net corp, foreign corp's one's loss against foreign corp two income, and that is your double dip, okay? So you've got the $100 loss of foreign corp one that would otherwise flow into U.S. corp as a DCL, okay? But it's offsetting income under a foreign jurisdiction income tax regime, the IIR, uh, of foreign corp two. That's your double dip. And the proposed reg said that's not allowed. You cannot take that loss into the U.S. And it's the case because even though 
countrywide doesn't have an income tax regime, which is usually required to have a separate unit under the DCL rules, it says that if that country's income is subject to an IIR in another jurisdiction, that would make, for example, Foreign Corp 1 here a separate unit and subject to the DCL rules. So I think we're about out of time. Big picture, let me go through an example with the disregarded payment loss rules. Okay, let's go back to our example here. Let's say that foreign cor U.S. corporation here gets a bank loan, okay? So they, they owe third-party interest to a bank. U.S. corporation on loans that those funds to Foreign Corp. 1 here, okay? And so then Foreign Corp. 1, um, I guess let's go to a poll, polling question real quick. Or possibly not. <laughs> um, so uh, U.S. Corp. loans those funds down to Foreign Corp. Foreign Corp. owes interest expense to U.S. Corp. Foreign Corp. 1 uses those funds to purchase the stock of Foreign Corp. 2. Okay, so the interest expense of Foreign Corp. 1 is not a DCL because it's disregarded. Okay, and and now you can have the double dip, right? Because that $100 isn't a DCL. U.S. Corp. has the, the interest expense but through the consolidated return regime, that $100, okay, is offset, offsetting the income of Foreign Corp 2 under that income of the foreign income tax consolidated return regime. These disregarded payment rules say that if you've got a situation like this, you're going to have to include in income, the U.S. corporation will, the $100 that make up of this disregarded payment loss rules, okay? So about one minute over time here, let's go ahead and launch that, that final polling question. Question, would you like to schedule time to discuss this topic further with one of today's presenters? And I think that kind of wraps up our presentation. Um, thank you very much for attending. I'll turn it back over to Mike. Yes, thanks, Jason. Everyone, well, we thank you for taking the time today to, to join us. Uh, the slides I know will be made available to you after this presentation. Uh, if you do have any questions about anything we talked about or maybe we, we didn't get to in the slides, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, our, our email addresses are included uh, as part of the presentation. So with that, we thank you very much. We'll leave a poll, I think the poll is still open, so we'll leave it here for another few seconds so everyone can get that done. Uh, but again, we thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today.